Hi, I'm Ted Haftegaber, founder and producer of Live Talks Los Angeles. Thanks for joining us. Since we started over a decade ago, we have brought you hundreds of conversations with storytellers, writers, actors, musicians, humorists, chefs, and thought leaders in business and science. You can watch and hear most of these in our YouTube channel and our podcast. For details, visit livetalksla.org. And now, Here's the show you've tuned in to see. Is this book really, you talk about politics, is it more about Congress or is it more about you? I think it's about how someone like me tries to navigate some place like Congress mm -hmm. and kind of the um, discontinuity between those two things. So I thought a lot about how hard it would be to get to Congress, about running in Orange County, about being a woman in politics, about winning. I thought when I got there, mm -hmm. the, the problem would, you know, sort of like I would have achieved it, the thing, yeah. and then I could just go to work working on very nerdy policies. Mm -hmm. And when I got to Congress, there's a whole nother set of expectations right. and norms and responsibilities and you're doing it wrong and this is not how we do it around here and you need to be more like this person or mm -hmm. that person and so I think the book is a lot about kind of how I am having to push a little bit at the institution in order to sort of survive and think about myself kind of treading water um, in the institution and there was a current making that hard to do. Yeah, how surprised were you by that pushback of people you know, just being, thinking you as a single mom is such a novel thing, and why can't you just do what we do? Yeah. No, I mean, there are definitely, I remember early on I tell the story in the book of going up to one of our Democratic leaders mm -hmm. and saying, do you know when we will be leaving Washington, <laughs> D.C.? And he said, no, no, not, not sure. And I said, well, he said, do you have somewhere to be? Mm. And I was like, yes. I have like three lightly supervised children and right. I, I need to be you know, respectful for the babysitter and the childcare and the flights and, and um, he lightly said, well, you supervised. know, lightly like, supervised. Yeah. yeah. And he right. said, well, you know, we just, we can't run Congress around your situation. So unique. <laughs> and we can't run Congress around people like you. Right. No one else has children. We've never heard of that. And there's kind of that mindset. And yeah. because a lot of the people in Congress who are women, many of them followed the two more traditional paths. Mm -hmm. They either married someone who was in politics or their right. father was in elected office. And this is the path that they followed or they waited until their kids were grown mm -hmm. in college and ran. And that's really changed a lot. We have a lot more young parents, both men and women. Right. We had the first, in my time I, in Congress, we had the first member of Congress take parental leave, and he was a man, Colin Allred. Of course, the guy does off. it first, right? It was, <laughs> right. And, yeah. and I will say that I'm grateful to Colin for doing it sure. because he will make it possible for women to do it more easily. But there was definitely some you know, this is, like there are 10 million single parents, give or take, yeah. in this country. The only place where that family structure is unique turns out to be in Congress. You know, <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. You know, a lot of people talk about the mustiness of Congress and some people point to the age of a lot of people, but it's kind of the institution too. Do you think like your example can help like change that institution which changes by these type of increments every couple of thousand years, it seems like, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think that the class I was elected with in 2018, mm -hmm. yes, I was the, the, the only single mom of young children to serve in the U.S. Congress ever. Um, and yes, but we also had people who were, um, you know, who ran small businesses. We had mm -hmm. people who were in the military. We had people who were nurses. We had people who came from not from politics. So they came directly from those other careers. Mm -hmm. um, they hadn't done the 20 years on the city council and run four times for assembly before they won and then worked their way up. And so a lot of us, I think, f 
felt like, why is this institution not functional, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And we came from workplaces that were functional. And so um, my, one of my early days in Congress, we were um, voting, not on a bill, but on voting for our leadership. And the system was you pushed and shoved your <laughs> colleagues mm -hmm. to get over here where they had a little A through D, E through H. Right. And they gave you a little paper ballot and one of those little like golf pencils. <laughs> and then you pushed and shoved all the way back to drop it off on mm -hmm. the other side of the room. And I remember just being in a, kind of a scrum and being pressed up against Congresswoman Alyssa Slotkin. And she had been elected like me in 2018. And she said, this is terrible. <laughs> and I was like, we have to fix this shit. Like, yeah. it just, like, this is how we're going to vote? Like, we're going to push and shove each other? Like, yeah. that's the... The system. Um, and it's the same thing, actually, when we vote on the House floor, we use a little machine and you put a little card in. Mm -hmm. And then it, it flashes up on the on the brocade wallpaper. Um, it says, you know, Wilmore, yay, Porter, nay. Mm -hmm. And um, there's only a couple of these machines, and so you have to push and shove mm -hmm. um, to get to one of these machines. And so when I first got there, maybe it was my first vote, I said, well, you know, Democrats are in charge now. Republicans have been in charge for a long time. It's like, we're all ready to fix this place. Right. And I said, we have to fix this. We have to get more machines. And one of my Democratic colleagues looked at me and said, those are brand new. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yes, and I love them. They work so well, right? Like overhead projectors or something. Yeah. You know, those types. So why, why is that institution so resistant to change? What's, what's causing the resistance? Because you know? from the outside, we don't understand why, like just an example like that, why do things have to be so elaborate to do nothing? Yeah. It seems like. <laughs> this elaborate process to do nothing at the end of the day. Yeah. No, so I think part of it is, some of it is respect mm -hmm. for the institution. And it's, it's sort of a healthy respect, almost fear that if we change things, we might break them and democracy is pretty fragile. That I think is the, the justified, mm -hmm kind of, I, I'm on board with that, I understand. Mm -hmm. I think the less good reason, which is also at play, is the system we have works really well to let the people who built the system, who have always been in the system, mm -hmm. have powerful voices. And so if you want the voice, if you want the system to work for people who are older and wealthy and you know steeped in politics, and then this system is pretty, actually works well for them. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't work well for young people. It doesn't work well for people who don't have a lot of savings right. and are trying to fly back and forth. It doesn't work well for moms. It doesn't work well for people um, who come back and forth every weekend. Mm -hmm. And so I think it works. It doesn't, it's not that it doesn't work at all. It's just that it, it works for a certain kind of person. Sure. But the bigger point, I think, is that it doesn't deliver outcomes we want. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I think one of the things I really try to do in the book and I try to do in Congress is be more transparent and honest right. about what we are doing. So, you know, I, I said this once and I, I got in a lot of trouble, but it's true. I said, they said, you know, are you ready to go back to Washington and get to work? <laughs> and I said, Washington, D.C., a place where time goes to get wasted. <laughs> and, I got in a lot of trouble for that, but the right. truth is... I love you getting in trouble. For here in California, yeah. every minute that I'm here, mm -hmm. whether I'm in the grocery store or um, you know, looking for a kid who is supposed to have wandered home, right. um, or I'm touring a business like I did today, or celebrating the opening of a water district, I am learning something about mm -hmm. California, about Californians, about what's working, what's not working, about yeah. our achievements and our struggles. That all feels so incredibly productive and important to me. Yeah. And then sometimes you're sitting in Washington <laughs> and everybody's like some of these people are eating like tuna fish sandwiches from uh, all, that's what they sell, tuna fish sandwiches and hot dogs. It can't be good. That's what the cafeteria yeah. has. And you're they're watching TV. It's impossible. And you're like, what are we doing? Yeah. Right? And so it's sort of a hurry up and wait. Well, we're going to watch vibe. paint dry for a little bit, Katie. Yeah, yeah. There's a and little then, bit of that. <laughs> and it has been interesting. I mean, I think again and again, we kind of said, a lot of us said, mm -hmm. we want to innovate, we want to modernize, right? And um, we were told it just has to be this way. Right. And I think it's been interesting with the Republicans in charge, 
Um, it turns out that if you want to vote at 10 o'clock and you're in charge, then you actually can vote at 10 o'clock. Mm. Not 11.30, not 1.30, not you know, quarter past two, but like if the Republicans say we're voting at 10, we're voting at 10. Now, we're not voting for anything good, right. but we are voting. And what that means is I don't have to cancel um, the school kids who traveled across the country to meet their congressperson. Mm -hmm. I can actually make that meeting. So there is a kind of ruthless efficiency about how Republicans are running it. Mm -hmm. It's unfortunate that that ruthlessness also extends to a lot of their policy initiatives. Yeah, I, yeah. I got the impression that the Democrats are a bit of a shit show when it comes to scheduling. At least that's the impression you give. It's like, why can't we plan, guys? Hello, right. can we plan? Did they, was that on that side of the aisle, or, or was that some of the culture also? Like, things popping up the last minute. Well, there's always going to be some of no that. No respect of your time at all. So, there, right. to be clear, I mean, there are, yeah. there are going to be... Pen oh, look, let me just run through what has happened yeah. in my four, four years. Um, longest shutdown in government history, impeachment, uh, pandemic, impeachment, uh, you know, I mean, big, big war with Ukraine. I mean, it's yeah. been a lot. Yeah, so there typical, are, typical three years. There yeah. are going to be those moments. Yeah. It's when we're supposed to vote to name the post office <laughs> at 10 and we can't get that done till 1130. Right. And it feels like, what, what is going on here? Yeah. You know, you're very uh, candid in the book, self-deprecating, which I enjoy a lot. You know, you refer to yourself as the fat kid, you know, talking about some of those struggles. And yet it's ironic that you're standing up for the small guy, <laughs> you know, like yeah. that's your thing. But one of the, the challenges in that, it seemed, was that as a freshman, you, I think you said, I am vote 120 or something like that. Yeah. I don't remember. The, so how did, how did you pierce through that and become a voice? Because that seems to me has to be a big challenge. Yep. I mean, you have to want to do it too, I suppose. So when I got to Congress and I, in the first couple months was just trying to actually find the right room mm -hmm. to go to. If you've ever been to Congress, it's, it's a maze. Yeah. Um, and you obviously get sworn in in January. So especially for California, it was like cold and I didn't have any, I had like open toe shoes. I mean, it's not, <laughs> I, I wasn't sure I was gonna win. I mean, it's Orange County, so. Um, <laughs> I was spending time in this. I got my Crocs. Exactly. I was in this maze and trying to find the right room, and you'd get there late, and then right. you'd be standing behind a bunch of guys, and you'd be like, "I'm here at the press right. conference, right?" And <laughs> so when I started, you know, having some interact, I'll call them interactions, mm -hmm. um, in hearings with folks like J.P. Morgan um, CEO Jamie Dimon, where I, I sort of really put it to him about how can, yeah. you know. Your employees can't afford to live. Yeah. Have you thought about that? And the answer was he hadn't. Uh -huh. And I, I, I hope I prompted him to do that. When I started to have to some of those moments, they take a lot of time, they take a lot of planning. Yes. I, I, I have to really think it through. Right. And I remember just being so tired and <laughs> sitting down in we going to vote. It was probably eight o'clock at night. And, one of my colleagues who's newly elected like me, and he's from California, and mm -hmm. he's just, well, he just looks great, you know? Uh -huh. And I said, I, I'm exhausted. <laughs> like, I think I'm doing it wrong. And he said, oh, no, you, you're definitely doing it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, well, what, what do you mean? And he said, well, you're confused about what your job is. <laughs> right. And you're focusing on the wrong things. Mm -hmm. And he said, your job is just to be vote number 218, mm. which is what it takes to pass a bill, right? It's 435 people, so the majority, right. the deciding vote is the 218th vote. And he said, your job is to be 218 and then get reelected to be 218 in mm. two years. And I had thought my job was like to fix some shit in government <laughs> and... <laughs> To try to rebuild trust in Congress right. and to help change the brand of the Democratic Party so that people understood we were fighting for them. And mm -hmm. he was like, no, no, that, that sounds like really draining. <laughs> He's like, just be 218. Yeah. I think some people get into it for the glory of the position, but you were the work you're doing in Congress you were doing before, was it the reason why you ran so you could maybe do it at a different level, more effectively? Uh, what, what was your reasoning why you wanted to run in the first place? Because, yeah. you know, running for office can be a really nasty thing, as we know, too. Yeah, it's a lot of people's worst nightmare, Yeah, I think, um, to run for office. 
for me, I, I deeply, deeply just, I wanted to be, mm -hmm. I wanted to be a bureaucrat. I wanted a cubicle in Washington. Katie, no one wants to be a bureaucrat. I wanted <laughs> to be a bureaucrat. I wanted, and, and I wanted to write laws. I wanted to write regulations. I wanted to sue banks who cheated us. I wanted to, to figure out how to make home mortgages that don't put us all into foreclosure like happened right. here um, in, you know, across the country. And so I applied for jobs in Washington and it was always where I got people asked me, are you interested in you know, being considered for this? And I was always too something. Mm -hmm. I was always not enough management experience, too junior, too senior, too pregnant, too, my favorite, too colorful. And so at some point, I can relate to that. One. I just, <laughs> at some point, I just decided, and it was really after President Trump was elected. It was, yeah. yes, it was outrage at President Trump, but to be honest with you, it was also that when Trump was elected, the opportunity I had to go to Washington mm -hmm. to work in the Hillary, what I thought was going to be the Hillary Clinton administration on housing and on consumer protection. You know, I was I was on that supposed to be on the transition team. I went to Nordstrom. I bought tights. <laughs> I bought like black boots. I bought wool things, uh -huh. and I packed them all in a huge suitcase. And I was going to go to you know that this was the, the, the day of the election. And the next morning, I was to fly out and to join the transition team. And and I rolled that suitcase right back into Nordstrom. Mm. And I, I said I would it's like a good to. Good thing Nordstrom has that return. That policy. return policy. Yeah. Well, and I said she, I said I would like to return all of this. Mm. And she said, didn't 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 anything work out? <laughs> and I said, no. <laughs> oh I mean, this God. was like two days after Trump was elected. Like, There's... no, lady, nothing worked out. And. And there's, so, there's not a no strong enough to properly answer right. that. Right. <laughs> and, and so I think feeling like those doors of opportunity were just not open for me. Mm. And so I, you know, I was like, well, I'll just wait. Mm -hmm. Right? I'll wait. Maybe somebody, you know, wait four years, wait eight years. And at some point I just decided I, I, I don't even like to wait mm -hmm. in the grocery store yeah. checkout line. Like I'm the person who... Like, I'll be like, oh, there's Pete, Pete's fast checkout. I'm getting Pete's line. Like, don't get behind this guy, right? Like, I, I'm not very patient. And so right. I just decided, why am I waiting for somebody else to make it possible for me to make a difference? Mm -hmm. I can just run. Yeah. And so I, I really thought about it that way. And so it was, I was probably in office maybe six months when mm -hmm. someone said to me, blah, 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 you as a politician. And I was like, politician? Where? And I realized they were talking about me mm -hmm. <laughs> and like I just didn't see myself that way yeah even though obviously that's what I am so actually like I looked it up in Wikipedia and that's what it said well, you, you Katie be... Porter is an American politician because yeah. like, <laughs> I think of myself as a mother and as a professor and yeah. as a consumer advocate and as a Californian and I have this long list of things that I am that are my identity yeah and I was like and as I say in the book, one of my favorite expressions is buy the ticket, take the ride. Yeah. And I think that's what happens when you, when you run, yeah. you, you buy the ticket, and then when you, you have to take the ride of being in Congress. <laughs> and sometimes it's bumpy. Well, you, you kind of emerged as a superhero early on, you know, in the Marvel Universe of Congress, I guess. And, uh, <laughs> such, such as it is. Yeah. Maybe a little more X-Men exactly. vibe than it is. I mean, somebody's got to save us from something, right? But you're, people feel like you're saving us. That's why I call you a superhero, you know? Instead of the cape, you have your whiteboard, right? <laughs> whiteboard your cape, all right? No cape, whiteboard, yeah. Uh, whose idea was the whiteboard? I wanna know, how did this start? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this started, the first time I used it was um, in a hearing with, with Jamie Diamond. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea was we were gonna lay out this budget. And so my staffer, Amanda, said, you know, we should, we should just, you know, we should go through a whole budget. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, we could write it out and <laughs> we could put it on a whiteboard and then that way he won't say, mm -hmm. as so many students, I was a law professor before I ran for Congress and I would ask these questions and then the student would say, can you repeat that please? <laughs> and so I didn't want Jamie Diamond to do that. I didn't want yeah. him to, because you only have five minutes and so these people are professionally coached stallers. I mean, they are coached. I have never heard anyone yeah. talk 
as yeah. slow <laughs> yeah. as Mark Zuckerberg, <laughs> who was really trying to run down the clock on the five minutes oh so we didn't God. get to ask him, what the hell is wrong with you and Facebook, yeah. right? Um, and so the, really the point of the whiteboard was so that when I was going through this like, budget. Can I unlike this? Yeah. So <laughs> I was going through the budget that he wouldn't be able to say, I couldn't follow that. I'm sorry. I right. couldn't repeat the question right. and get off the hook. Exactly, yeah. So it's the same purpose I had in the classroom, which was really to, to follow things along. But it's also an accountability technique. Before we mm -hmm. used the whiteboard, we had a hearing with, I think it was before, but with Wells Fargo. Yeah. And we had found them saying something in a court document mm. that was directly contradictory to what they were testifying to. Yeah. And so we blew that up real big. <laughs> <laughs> and so my, the colleague I sat next to, Cindy Axney, in that committee was so good natured. Yeah. I, you know, she, she flipped a tough seat in Iowa, actually, where I grew up. She served for two terms and she lost this last Congress, but Cindy was so great. Yeah. I mean, I'd haul out this big white one and plunk it basically right in front of her face. And Cindy would like hold on to the edge and be like. <laughs> so my colleagues, Rashida Tlaib, the two of them were really, you know, yeah. good, good, good helpers in terms of helping me get the props going. Yeah, I love that Wells Fargo story too, because you had uh, uh, went into the, the same person was the, the, the C. Yep. <laughs> you know? And he completely lied, of course, at first and said, Wells Fargo doesn't make mistakes. And so that had to be a nice karmic moment. Yes, yes. You know, to have it come full circle all those years later. Yeah. No, Wells Fargo yeah. tried to tell me that um, when I was a researcher, I did a big study showing how Wells Fargo, what they filed in bankruptcy cases when they were trying to take people's homes. Yeah. And they just screwed up all the time. Mm -hmm. Like the instructions say, attach a copy of the mortgage. They just wouldn't attach it. Now, you know, if you're trying to get it to a bank loan or a credit card and you don't fill something out right, you get denied. Exactly. These guys weren't attaching any of the documentation. Their math didn't add up. They had things like $792 miscellaneous, right, on their itemization of fees. And, mm -hmm. and what they told me was, you know, I was wrong. They were right. They didn't make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And they obviously made a, a lot. It felt like a lot of that was intimidation, too, which, of course, they use. How often do you think, well, let me ask you this first. Do you think a lot of these banks are just crooked? Or do you think, and this, you asked this question in your book, too, are they really making mistakes and then just trying to cover it up? Yeah. So it turns out that cheating people is incredibly profitable. <laughs> yes. And that, you know, when I say it, it sounds obvious, right? Yeah. But CEOs know that too. Mm -hmm. And so what a lot of companies do is they bank on the fact that they probably won't get caught, mm -hmm. that we'll probably give up the 18th time we press one for an operator and input our number and get disconnected. and. And so they they know that we're not going to fight back. Yeah. Um, and so and the law, consumer law, consumer protection is despite all of us liking to have our rights protected, mm -hmm. it actually has not been traditionally a big focus of government. Yeah. And so you know we have a lot of kind of it's your fault if you get cheated well, attitude here. I think a lot of people feel guilty and they which is, here's what's really weird is many people believe the banks when, if, when they're making these false statements like they say well they must be right like they can't imagine that they're acting poorly even though they they might see the evidence right in front yep. of their eyes yeah so we I mean we definitely when I was working as the foreclosure um, protection monitor for the state of California in 2012 2013 2014 mm. I mean Bank of America at the time had a lot of loans in California because they they made one of the great purchases of all time by buying countrywide. Yeah, good job. And they, you know, their, some of their excuses were, were just unbelievable. Like, mm -hmm. um, well, I, I guess we just don't know what they owe. Mm -hmm. Well, then you don't get to take their home, right? And so, you know, we remember asking Bank of America once, we said, they said, nobody responds. These people don't want to save their homes. <laughs> and we said, well, the part where you tell them that they might be able to prevent their house from being foreclosed on is on the fourth page of a single space, yeah. 10 point font letter. And they said to me, where do you think we should put that sentence? And I was like, first, first, like, 
you know how to use all of the fancy fonts and the bold and the, you know, when you get those credit card applications, I mean, confetti practically falls out. Exactly. Some of them look like my wedding invitation, right? Exactly. But then when you're in trouble and you yeah. ask for help, you get buried in paperwork. Mm -hmm. And it's an intentional strategy. And so I think, you know, the, the traditional rule in banking is that the customer pays all the fees mm -hmm. twice. Right? I mean, if you're doing it right, you just can charge them and charge them and charge them and, and right. people don't push back. Do you feel that the younger generation is avoiding a lot of uh, homeowning and that kind of thing? There seems to be a trend of people renting more. Do you think a lot of it is from, you know, a lot of them were very young during 2007 when that whole financial crisis came up and the inflation hour. Are people afraid of homeowning and that kind of stuff now, do you think? They can't afford it. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the truth. Right. Um, we have an incredible, incredible housing affordability crisis. Mm -hmm. And yes, it manifests itself most visibly in chronic street homelessness. Oh, it's so bad right now. Man. But it is a problem for people at a lot of different walks of life, a lot of income levels, a lot of ages and stages of life. So I did an event recently at University of California, Davis, and I had, and it's really hard to get into Davis. Like you need like a four point something something. <laughs> and mm. I did an event with 70 students, undergrads, graduate students, and I said, how many of you plan think that you will buy a home in California mm -hmm. at some point in your life. And not a single hand went up. Now, those yeah. students, some of them probably will buy homes, but that is a serious, serious problem. And it's not that they don't want to, it's that they can't afford to. Yeah. And the federal government needs to take a much, much bigger role in making housing affordable. The last time we made a really big investment in helping people buy houses was really in the GI Bill yeah, World after World War II. Mm -hmm. And look at the incredible growth and opportunity and stability that created. Yeah. And so I think we need at the federal level to do a lot more on homeownership. And we in the Democratic Party need to identify and talk about housing as what it is, the biggest issue facing many families. Yeah, it's terrible. When I look at, when you look at the last 30, 40 years, housing and education, out of control in terms of the inflated cost of those two. Yeah. They, they've kind of grown up together where everything else is kind Can of- Can I have a third one? Yeah, sure. Child care. Yeah. When we just talked about how unaffordable housing is for people. Mm -hmm. When you survey California families that have children and you ask them what is their biggest expense, child care is even more expensive than housing. Yeah. And so when my daughter Betsy went, I was recruited here like so many Californians. I came here for a job. Mm -hmm. I came here for the opportunity and who the hell would ever leave this place? <laughs> yeah. It's so terrific mm -hmm. here. It's amazing. And um, when I got here, my daughter went to University of California Irvine Preschool. And I was so excited that they had on-site daycare. It was so great. I already had two boys that were a handful. And Betsy's tuition to be a four-year-old mm -hmm. at the University of California Irvine cost more than it would have cost for her to be an undergraduate. Mm. And you know, you only get nine months to save for the, the childcare. You get 18 months, 18 years to save for the, the college right, exactly, tuition. Exactly. And that's by the way, not anomalous to California. In about half of states, childcare costs, childcare tuition costs more than college tuition. That's crazy. In state, public college tuition. Why are those, why are those costs so high? Well, part of it is, is that it, it to, you have to invest in the people doing the work. Mm -hmm. Children take a lot of work. And so it's very, very hard to have the ratios and the, the enrichment, the safety, the location, everything that we need. This mm -hmm. is why we have public schools, because yeah. if we each had to fund our own school, that would be prohibitively expensive. So I think we need to invest in childcare, understand it as an investment in our workforce, mm -hmm. understand it as a way to have strong labor force participation. People will say to me, well, I don't have any kids. And I would say, yes, but do, do, do you want to have someone take care of you when you're old? <laughs> exactly. It's going to be that kid, right? Yeah. And so I think we have to think about treating childcare as this economic building block. That is, by the way, how every other one of our competitor nations understands childcare, yeah. which is as a building block of a strong economy. Yeah, your children play an important part in your book as well. Um, I'm really struck by how inventive, stealing like the neighbor's a lawn sign of your opponent, very funny, of uh, movement in there. They seem to be very understanding of what you're doing, but as a parent, I know there's gotta be some guilt about missing events and that type of stuff. Do they have a good relationship with mom being away a lot and 
maybe some of these things that aren't normal for them? Where are they with that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's mixed. Um, I think they have their moments mm -hmm. when they're very proud of me. And I think they have their moments when they would just like their mom to focus only on them. And I think mm -hmm. that's pretty natural. And I think a lot of parents in a lot of walks of life face this from their kids. Um, but you know, they, they definitely, I think overall, I guess what I would say is one of them said to me, I wouldn't say this has been a good experience, <laughs> but I guess it's an experience I'm glad I've had. Uh -huh. And I, I think that's kind of how they think about it. But, um, you know, when they, I've had my two older sons, each one has given my election night speech. My, my oldest son gave it in um, 2018. Mm. My son Paul gave it this year. Yeah. And it was very clear from giving those speeches that they understand on some very basic level kind of why it matters to have mm -hmm. people in our democracy yeah. um, who are willing to be tough and who are willing to fight and who are willing to hold people to account. And they have seen me hold them to account. Like, what about that laundry, <laughs> right? And so they, um, you know, Betsy's like, I clean my room. And I was like, mm-mm, don't make me. So one of the things I have in the book is I have a little section on how to whiteboard anyone about anything. Mm -hmm. And the example I give in it's the good. book is that my son Paul, we call him LB for laundry boy, and he gets paid $7.50 an hour yeah. to do the laundry. Now he does not fold, he just puts it in, hits the button, moves it, hits the button. So I, sh I do a little whiteboard in the book showing that, you know, Paul tried to negotiate for a raise, <laughs> and I, I did a little whiteboard for him, and I was like, let's see, one minute, dump it in. One minute, put the detergent. And I added it up, and Paul's making eighteen seventy-five an hour to do this laundry. And I said, Paul, do you understand that there are people out there in dangerous and dirty and difficult jobs mm -hmm. making seven dollars and fifty cents an hour? You are not getting a raise. You're making eighteen seventy-five. And he said, you should raise the minimum wage. And I was like, he's right, he's right. I should raise the minimum wage. But his solution was that I ought to solve the problem yeah. of workers not making enough so that he could then be in a stronger position to negotiate. You, you should have turned to and go, you just got whiteboarded. Yeah. <laughs> Bam. Mm -hmm. uh, so now you want to run for the Senate. Mm -hmm. uh, Diane Feinstein. Yeah. Senator Feinstein is going to move on. We're not sure what the timing of that will be. Um, with, is she going to be there for the rest of her term, do you think? Is she stepping aside? I know she's had some illness recently. Yeah, that she, um, she got shingles, which yeah. is very painful and terrible. Mm -hmm. So she's been out for the last few weeks. I don't know her exact timeline on returning, um, but she has already announced that she won't run for re-election. Right. So whether her time in the Senate, whether she continues all the way up to the end of her term mm -hmm. or she makes the decision to, to step down sooner, I am absolutely, you know, I bought the ticket, I'm taking the ride, I'm absolutely <laughs> in it to win it. Uh -huh. And I think this campaign, the Senate campaign, is so important for California. We really need to have a conversation about what we want from our federal government mm -hmm. and what do we want from our leaders and how do we think about how to position California to, to push the nation to, to be better and to do better. How can California lead um, and how can we get federal attention on some of the problems we're facing. And so I think the Senate race is about sending our kind of toughest fighter to Washington. And I would be proud to have that opportunity and I'm ready to get to work. Good. Yeah. Um, When you talk about the federal level, of course, you'll be fighting for California. Uh, how tough is it at the federal level to stop some of the things happening? Like, to me, I think one of the worst things going on now is this whole, I'll call it the abortion debacle, is what I'll call it. Uh, the abortion Michigas. <laughs> um, I think repealing Roe v. Wade was one of the worst things mm -hmm. ever. It's just such, to me, it's just a complete disrespect for um, women having agency over their bodies when it comes to that. I just think it's terrible. But what's happening in the states is even worse, it seems like. This is like a wildfire that's starting. Is there anything that could be done at the federal level, maybe in a role as senator, to, I mean, with states' rights in play and all that stuff, can you do anything? Yep. Mm -hmm. So what the Supreme Court did in the Dobbs decision is overturn Roe, which said that there is a constitutional right to an abortion. Mm -hmm. So there's no longer under Dobbs a constitutional 
protection for abortion. That doesn't mean there cannot be a federal right to it that is given to us all by Congress. Mm -hmm. So we don't need to, I mean, while I would really like to mix up the Supreme Court, we don't need to wait for that to restore everybody's freedom to make their own decisions about when and if to start a family. We mm -hmm. can do that by passing a law in Congress that guarantees the right to an abortion at the federal level. And the, you know, we had the majority in, in Congress last, you know, until, until January, and we did not get this across the finish line. And we passed it through the House. It was Congresswoman Judy Chu here in, um, from LA who's bill, the Women's Patient Protection Act. We passed it in the House. We had that Democratic majority, and we sent it over to the Senate, where lately good ideas have gone to die. Mm -hmm. And they, they didn't take it up. And so they, you know, they hide behind the filibuster. Well, why do you think they didn't pick it up? Um, I think Because there's got to be a reason. I mean, for something like that. It's not like you go, oh, what's that debarge thing? Oh, okay, what's this thing? No, 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 yeah. no. That's huge. Yeah. So I think there's two reasons. One is the they continue kind of fealty to the filibuster, which mm -hmm. is an, an, an institution, a rule, that if it ever served a purpose, it no longer does. And what the filibuster is doing today is allowing senators to avoid having to take votes and show their constituents exactly mm -hmm. where they stand. And so anybody who thinks, well, this vote might not make everybody happy, can, can just basically put a hold on it and cancel the vote. Um, and I think the reality is, even if we had gotten the filibuster lifted, I don't know that we had 51 votes. Mm. Um, I don't know that Senator Manchin would have, would have taken this vote. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think this is why it's really important that we, that we get past, we get the right 50 um, and we get to 51 and then we, we get rid of the filibuster and the Senate needs to start doing its job which is sort of, you know, traditionally it's been the last line of defense mm -hmm. for our democracy. Will we ever see super majorities in the Senate again, like a 60 seat Senate, that type of thing? Are those days over? I think those days are not coming soon. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't say never. Um, I think it's un very, very unclear where the Republican Party goes mm -hmm. um, from here. Um, how do they rebuild? I think they're gonna lose in 2024. And I think that Joe Biden has more Joe Biden has more affirmative achievements to run on mm -hmm. than any president in recent history. Um, this is somebody who has just so many accomplishments, bringing down the cost of insulin, bipartisan infrastructure law, is so many things to run on. And so I think the question is, what do Republicans do post this loss in 2024? And I think if they, if they continue down this path of extremism, they continue down this path of hate. Mm -hmm. I think they're going to continue to lose younger voters, mm -hmm. who, by the way, pretty quickly become middle-aged voters who pretty quickly, right? So there's, there's not a growth path for them unless they rethink their, their party's values. Mm -hmm. So we could see us getting to a supermajority, but at a tremendous cost. Right. But let me ask you an uncomfortable question on that. Do you, is President Biden... Do you see him connecting for this? I mean, I know you have to say yes and everything, but I, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how to ask this properly, because I, I do want to be respectful. I do like President Biden, but I mean, I think he's very old right now in a way, <laughs> let, me say, let me say it properly, in a way that is not conducive to running for office, let's say. Yeah. Um, because running for office has a different metric than governing. Mm -hmm. You know, running for office is a lot about you know, uh, the sheen, you know, I mean, Kennedy won the debate on television, Nixon won it on the radio, <laughs> you know, that's part of running for office, you know. Uh, a real vibrant young Republican candidate against Biden, mm, you know. I mean, vibrantly crazy. <laughs> but I, I, I mean, let's America has, has not proven that they will not vote for crazy. That's right, that's right. Yeah. Um, so let me say this, I mean, I think that this, this sort of, it's interesting to hear you try to sort of craft the question. Mm -hmm. Um, let me let you in on a little secret. Is the mofo too old? That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> right. President Biden knows that he's old. <laughs> it's not a secret. He's aware. He knows he's old. Mm -hmm. Like, we don't have to tiptoe around that. The man, the man has, you know, he has birthdays just like the rest of us. Mm -hmm. He knows how old he is. And, and so, look, his campaign, every president's campaign, mm -hmm. looks a little different. I mean, I remember Clinton. I, I grew up in Iowa, so I've seen all of these yahoos make their, their passes through <laughs> Iowa. Yeah. And they all have their own style. They all have their own strengths and mm -hmm. weaknesses. President Biden is not going to campaign in the same way. 
Um, the, his strengths are interpersonal. His strengths are his compassion, mm. his ability to kind of not take a lot of the partisan bait, but instead talk about what matters to America. Mm -hmm. His strengths are getting shit done. Um, and so I think he's got a lot of strengths to run on, but, you know, He's, he's not going to run the same campaign that uh, President Obama ran. Right, but to be clear, let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. President, I went to a Women's History Month thing at the White House last month, and President Biden said something that has really stayed with me. President Biden has appointed more black women federal judges mm -hmm. than every prior American president put together. Yeah, great. So... Right? President Obama led many including great the Supreme accomplishments. Court. And right. President Obama was, you know, he could fill the stadium. And President Obama really struggled to get judges appointed. So each, I think each of these people is their own people. And as we think about who comes after President Biden, I think we'll be thinking about what do we need from our party? What do we need to do mm -hmm. to grow our base? So, um, you know, I think he's got a lot of issues where I really do see him connecting with younger voters. Child care is one of them. Mm -hmm. um, student loan debt, two free years of community college. I think he has a lot to say to younger voters, mm -hmm. but he's probably not going to say it on Tic Tac, okay? <laughs> well, <laughs> did you say Tic Tac? Yeah, oh, I saw that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm just concerned he goes off and starts talking about corn pop and things like that and starts smelling people's hair, and it's like, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Stop it, Joe. No, no, I will say I have had many chances to interact with the president, and uh -huh. um, you know, I was a co chair of the Elizabeth Warren campaign. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I was on another team, right? At least for a while. And so you I had have, a lot of these jokes then. I, You're ready, yeah. right? I have mm. really, really mm. been impressed with President Biden. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my daughter Betsy, who's 13, um, has had the chance to meet the president, and she is a super fan. Mm -hmm. And this is like the real definition of younger voters. She won't even make it in time for him. So I, I think we, we stand with him. We help him. We knock doors. We help connect with young people um, for him. But I feel really, really good about his chances and about... Are, Dem are Democrats united right now? We've always felt that they have seemed to have been divided a lot, particularly in Biden's first year, you know. The, all the resistance to that bill, I can't remember what it was, was between the Democrats, <laughs> you know, yeah. all the fighting about it. You know, yeah. where, where is the party right now? Yeah, I think everyone's united behind President Biden, and I think it's because he has delivered on so many different priorities. Mm -hmm. And on the ones that he hasn't gotten done, you know, two free years of community college, child care, for example, he is very clear that that work remains and that mm -hmm. he's committed to doing it. So I, I think that we are very united behind President Biden. I think we're eager to see him reelected. We're eager to retake the House so we can go back to getting things done mm -hmm. and to have a Senate that actually passes the bills that the Democratic House sends them. And so mm -hmm. um, I feel really good about our prospects. That You mentioned that debate about the sort of Democratic infighting. Right. You know, some of that is, and this is sort of goes to the title of the book, Politics is Messier Than My Minivan, which is not clean. Um, mm -hmm is that some of that tension between Democrats is healthy mm -hmm. um, sure. and is normal. And I think we all sort of want this to be seamless and easy. But if it's seamless and easy, we're, we're actually not doing right by how sort of people thought about what democracy looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that some of that tension was healthy. And the goal was we wanted to make sure the president got his agenda passed. Right. Both the bipartisan infrastructure law and the stuff in Build Back Better. And so we were trying to sequence it in a way where we felt like if we pass the bipartisan infrastructure law first, some of our Democratic colleagues won't be there for us to pass the Build Back Better Act, won't mm -hmm. be there for us on issues like childcare and climate and other things. And yes, I'm talking about Joe Manchin. <laughs> <laughs> Call him out on my podcast, I don't know. Um, what would you say are the Dems' biggest vulnerability? And do you see yourself running for senator, for a senator, maybe as a way to, you know, shore up some of those vulnerabilities, maybe with some of the ideas that you had? Yeah, Democrats need to understand that it is not going to be enough. If it ever was, it is not going to be enough going forward to simply say the two things that we're very good at saying: I'm a Democrat, and I'm better than that guy. That that's not enough. Yeah, and. 
you know, I think one of the things about Trump was that it was very easy for Democrats to kind of say like, we're not Trump. Right. And, and I mean, low bar, low bar, <laughs> right? And so as we look at, at people who are registering to vote and younger people, um, new voters, maybe immigrants, people mm -hmm. who are citizens, they are increasingly registering as no party preference voters, as independents. Wow. Really? And they're not, they're not registering as no party preference voters because they're unsure what they believe. They are registering as no party preference voters because they are concerned that neither party is really fighting for them. Mm. They're concerned about Democrats who take corporate PAC money. They're concerned about a Democratic Congress that will not pass a ban on congressional stock trading. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think we have to really invest in delivering for people and rebuilding trust in government. And we have real work to do as Democrats, and it's because I share the values of the Democratic Party um, that I want to see us grow that party to be able to reach out to younger voters. So I, you know, I said jokingly at an event the other day to one of my Democratic colleagues, I said, you know, what do you think about the Democrats' platform on housing? Mm -hmm. And he laughed and he said, yeah, we don't have one. So this is the number one issue that people care about right now, not just in California, but actually across the country. So yeah. we do have work to do as a party. I think we have done a great job of motivating and engaging young people to turn out because things of like, you know, Donald Trump, abortion being on the ballot, mm -hmm. um, LGBTQ rights, trans rights being under attack. But we have to keep those folks trusting that Democrats will fight for them. Mm -hmm. Has it been different with uh, Pelosi handing off the baton to Hakeem? Yeah, I think each leader has their own style. Um, each leader has their own style. I think, um, you know, Speaker Pelosi um, had kind of strong, uh, strict mom vibes, um, and I think that That's was great. you know that was it. important. That's how she herded all of us to to come together and to vote on bills. I mean, I, you know, people. Someone said to me once, like, "You're fearless," and I I thought to myself, should I tell them that I once hid in the women's bathroom? after taking a vote so the speaker couldn't find me. Oh my I God. mean, and when I went in there, by the way, there were other people hiding. <laughs> um, there was a whole little group of us hiding in the women's bathroom, and which of course she can come in and find us. We shouldn't <laughs> hit in the men's. And, um, but so I think that you know, each leader has their strength. I think Speaker Pelosi was really good at kind of creating that, that voting discipline mm -hmm. um, and keeping everyone, you know, this is what we're going to do and you're going to get in the boat and we're all going to point this direction. Um, I think Hakeem um, is a really gifted communicator. I yeah. think he's a very naturally comfortable communicator. Um, he's from a different part of the country. He's from New York. He's our first black um, speaker. And so I, I think they both have different things. The, the House definitely feels different mm -hmm. um, with Hakeem in, in charge instead of Nancy. And I, I think you know, people have their different preferences. But I think that change, that transition is very, very healthy. And right. Democrats need to have confidence in this next generation of leaders. And this next generation of leaders needs to earn our confidence. For sure, that's a fact. Um, well, I think we're gonna get to questions pretty soon, but before we do, we'll just do like, well, I call this a lightning round, a quick lightning round. And I wanna do a little bit differently. Actually, I've never done it, so this is the first time. So <laughs> I'm like, how am I doing different? Yeah. But uh, since you're a single mom, mm -hmm. Right, uh, smingle. There's yep. a term. Yep. Yeah, no. uh, I'm gonna give you some statements here, and you're gonna either swipe left or swipe right on okay. these. Okay, swipe left meaning no disagree, or swipe right. Yeah, that sounds good. You know, or you agree with that. Okay, uh, there is a real benefit to bipartisanship. Bipartisanship is good. Swipe left or swipe right. Swipe right. Bipartisanship is good because it Why? often reflects that the American people, bipartisanship is good when it, when it reflects that the American people share a set of values. Okay. So when we have bipartisanship because a bunch of people in Washington want to cover their asses, <laughs> that is not, that's a, that's a swipe left. Mm -hmm. When we have bipartisanship because literally everybody agrees that our bridges mm -hmm. shouldn't crumble, that is a really positive thing. It is easier to succeed and to govern and to thrive if you have less disagreement. So if we can get to that bipartisanship without compromising core values, that's a positive. Is the hardest thing that things are added onto those bills, though, uh, from especially from the extreme factions uh, of, of any particular party? Oh, I mean, look, the, it is getting harder and harder <laughs> yeah. and harder. Even in my right. five years in Congress, it is getting harder and harder to find Republicans. 
that yeah. one can actually collaborate with, communicate with, feel safe in an elevator with. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's getting tougher. Um, and so that, I think, is a real problem. And I mm -hmm. think when we talk about gerrymandering and we talk about sort of how boundaries are drawn for congressional districts, we're often really, really focused on how this might um, make it harder to elect a Democrat, for mm -hmm. example. That's true, but it also really gerrymandered districts also mean that the, the Republicans get more crazy. Right. right. And so you have people Absolutely. who represent, you know, the most Democratic districts. Those people get more and more. Um, and so I think it's it's good to be able to communicate with Americans, Republicans, Democrats, and independents. Mm -hmm. I don't share the values of all of my constituents. I represent Orange County. But I have to be able to communicate with all of them. I have to be able to listen respectfully to all of them. Um, so, yeah, I would say, yeah. Okay. Um Marjorie Taylor Greene is the craziest person in Congress. That is like bat chick crazy. Swipe left or swipe right? Swipe right. Woo, swipe right. I mean, she is a different category, I have to okay. say. Okay, please tell us everything you know. Please. No, I mean, look. Don't leave anything out. My basic, my basic rule about Marjorie is, like, how far is far enough? For the personal safety threshold, again, so I was a, I was that a, ATM distance is what I right, call it. I was right. a scout. I was a scout yeah. leader, mm -hmm. and when you teach the kids how to use the pocket <laughs> knife, you have something called the blood circle. Right. And the idea is, you know, could the knife cut anybody? And that's how I think about Marjorie. Like I, I don't go in her, in her. I mean, she's 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 a lot. She's a lot, and yeah. she's not very functional. She's not very effective. There are Republicans who I strongly disagree with, mm -hmm. who like I have constant battles with um, Garrett Graves from Louisiana, mm -hmm. who's like basically, you know, Mr. Fossil Fuel. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, Garrett's not gonna like. E -e -e -e. I mean, it's, he's. We, I just disagree with him. Like truly right? terror. <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I think that's a different, a different level, yeah. a different, a different beast. Perhaps, I agree. Say. I agree. Um, will the tangerine Idi Amin, uh, <laughs> the orange Julius Caesar, as I call him, um, actually go to prison? Swiping left or swiping right on that? I would say probably not, as much as that hurts my Swiping feelings. left. Um, that's not my. That's not what I want. I'm mm -hmm. telling you what I think is going to happen. Yeah. Um, I think. I that agree with you. By the, the way, the wheels of yeah. justice turn slowly. Mm -hmm. um, he's also, by the way, old, um, <laughs> and unlike Joe Biden, from the coma owner doesn't know it. Um, <laughs> well, Trump doesn't know that. All that fast food is keeping him alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and the so, KFC is like propping him up. Yeah. yeah. So I don't. So I. I am not certain that we will. see that. I agree with you. Um, now, I do think the, the you know, I think these state charges, you know, I, I think they'll proceed ahead and I think there could be more state charges. We don't really know where the federal charges are, if they're ever mm -hmm. going to come. We've been waiting an awfully long time. Yeah. So even as, you know, I think it was important for the January 6th commission to do its work, mm -hmm. they took two full years to do yeah. it. And the consequence of that is, and now the DOJ is taking, and you know, four months and counting. And so... I think the longer we wait and the closer we get to the presidential election, mm. I mean, we're gonna we're gonna defeat Donald Trump. I'm just not sure that it's gonna be by incarcerating him rather than just beating him the old-fashioned way. Mm. And that's I know that's not satisfying, but okay. Realistically, mm. look, I mean, I spent my career watching you know Wall Street bankers, mm -hmm. when I watch them tank the world economy and then get in their yacht. Yeah. So people I, get away with things. People get away with things, yeah, and I think do. it's a real problem for our government. More accountability and more oversights needed. But yeah, I think it's going to be you know Trump's going to have very good lawyers, and he's going to stall, and I, I think it's going to take a lot to to put him away. It's going to be beautiful. Mm. Yeah. Um, okay, last one. President Katie Porter, are you swiping oh. left? <laughs> are you swiping uh, right? Are you swiping left? Are you I, I'm right? gonna swipe no on this one. Um, oh, I'm very wait, focused. You're swiping. Where's my? I need some some tea that I can throw at you. Yeah, right yeah. Uh, no, I am I am very focused on becoming Senator Katie Porter. Mm -hmm. um, and okay. you know, I I think one of the things that I was important to me in the book was to try to be honest about how I what I thought Congress would be like, what it was really like, mm -hmm. what I learned. 
Um, some of the folks who, you know, the guy who told me to be vote 218, and I was like, uh-uh, right? I'm going to be Katie Porter, not vote yeah. 218. Um, but, but there's work to be done. There's learning to be done. Um, and so I'm just so excited about being able to engage more in the state, to travel more, um, to hear more Californians' voices, to solve more problems, to be a vibrant fighter for California in the Senate, and to help us win, by the way, in every part and pocket of California and this country. California needs to have a senator who knows how to win tough races, who knows how to win. Um, you can send me to Montana. I was a nine-year 4 h -er. Send me to Montana for John Tester. I'm there. I showed pigs. I I'm ready, John. Right? Send me to Ohio for Sherrod Brown to talk about what predatory lending and payday lending does to gut um, the, the prospects of communities of color and people of color to build wealth. So. I'm really committed to making sure that I become senator and as senator that I deliver a durable majority for Democrats for years to come. Bravo. Very good. <laughs> All right. Seb, let's, uh, shall we take some questions from the audience? Yes, it is time to take questions from the audience. Just a quick reminder, around here, questions typically begin with a W or an H, sometimes a D. They are generally short. There is no such thing as a two-part question. And tonight, only Larry Wilmore gets to ask follow-up questions. Oh, very good. Yes, I'm from West Hollywood. And you have two very excellent competitors in the Senate race. We have to acknowledge that. Uh, there may be more. We don't know. How is it that you are better prepared to be senator than are the other two? Mm -hmm. So both Adam Schiff and Barbara Lee are terrific. And we should, be, we should say that about each other as much as we can, because we all three have made important contributions, and all three of us are, I think, terrific Californians. And so I'm honored to be in a race with them. I think the thing that I can bring to this job um, that's different about me is what I was talking about at the end. I know how to win every possible vote. When you have knocked doors in Huntington Beach, you can do anything. <laughs> and. And so I think when I think about how are we going to win back the House, there is no path to doing that that doesn't involve winning tough seats in California. And we need someone at the top of the party, at the top of the ticket, who will say things, who will message, and who will engage, who makes it easier for everybody to win down ballot here in California, but also those Senate and House races across the country. I think the other thing is, look, I, I say this in the book. I didn't go to Washington to follow the rules. I went to Washington to rewrite them. Because the way that we've always done things in Washington is not getting families what they need sometimes. And so I'm the only person in this race who has never taken corporate PAC money. I am the only person in this race who does not take federal lobbyist money. And for me, that is about demonstrating to folks that they can count on me to fight and push for them. And so, you know, I think that is going to be a, a big issue. It's about rebuilding trust in government. Um, so folks have seen me go toe to toe with big pharma, ask, exposing why prescription drugs are so expensive. And the answer is because they're lining their own pockets as executives. They have seen me push the director of the CDC to make COVID testing free, right? And, and that actually happened. And we all began to be able to get free COVID testing. So I think. I have my own particular skill set. Adam and Barbara have theirs. This is going to be a robust and amazing race for California that if we do it right, it's going to energize our whole state and help us rebuild our party for years to come. Do you love, um, yeah, um, Do you feel like you'll not only be fighting for votes, but kind of fighting the establishment running against uh, someone like uh, Adam Schiff and Barbara Lee? Yeah, I mean, look, they, they've both been, they combined, they've been in Congress about 50 years. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been there five. So it's not good or bad, it's just different. Mm -hmm. And I think it's up to voters to decide how they weigh those different things. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, you know, one of the things that I talk about a lot when we talk about diverse leadership and diverse representation is that that includes multi-generational leadership. So I think that it is important to have people in Congress, in the Senate, and the House who have been there for generations. And it is important to have people who are relatively new. And it's that mix and that synergy that I think produces the most productive and representative and responsive Congress that we can have. Mm -hmm. There is an establishment in Washington, and I am not part of it. 
and I'm okay with that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I have friends, yeah. and then I have colleagues, and I think that's true for a lot of us. And some of my friends are my colleagues, but I didn't go to Washington to, to kind of curry favor and become the, the, the darling of the lobbyist cheese, you know, this cheese cube reception. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not there for that. I am there yeah. to get things done, um, and I am there to, to hold people, powerful people, to account. And so, yeah, I think, I think that's probably right. I mean, some people have said to me, well, you know, I've known Adam for 35 years. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was 14 then. So we're just different, <laughs> right? And, yes. you know, some people have said to me, we need more black women in the Senate, to which I say, amen, we do. And so for some people, that's going to mean voting for Barbara Lee. Some people have said we, we're not making any progress on growing the number of women. We're, we're, we're still at half of what representation would look like. So I think everybody's going to have different factors and things that they weigh. But I think for what really stands out for me is the willingness to stand up to powerful corporations, to fight for ordinary families, and the ability to win tough races and communicate across party lines without ever compromising my values. I'll give you uh, yeah, a I'll give you a quick tip of how to answer the question. Uh, we need more black women in the Senate. I agree with you, sister. You know what would be a good state for that? I think you just got. <laughs> and just, well, I mean, look, we, we really do. We need more Latina women. We need more indigenous women. Right. We, I mean, we need more women, period. And we need people, most of all, whoever they are, who yeah. will fight for what black families and black women need. Because for too long, their needs have been ignored by the establishment in Washington. And I spent a lot of my career fighting predatory lending, mm -hmm. fighting to make sure that health care is more affordable, fighting to make sure that child care workers are paid a livable wage. So. It's about getting things done for um, for black women and for people of color. And we, we should sure. all be very committed to that project. Yep. Oh, hi, Katie. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Hi, Katie. <clears throat> I think you may have already answered my original question since you, uh, I, I originally was going to ask, what is, your, um, what is your strategy to win? Uh, so you already kind of answered that. But then I guess I'd do a follow-up question is I recently heard something on uh, KCRW, the local NPR station, they were talking about that Gavin Newsom might uh, be able to appoint someone if um, if it comes up, and it didn't sound favorable uh, for you to get that appointment. And then, of course, if someone gets appointed, they kind of have a leg up. So I, I'm not sure what we can do to help you <laughs> to yeah. to win. Are you talking about knocking off Senator Feinstein? <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. No, but there, I think there is some version of Gavin Newsom might uh, be able to appoint someone if she... Yeah, yeah. So let me just, let me, this is how I always try to answer questions. Um, let me just start with the facts so that we all are on the same page and we all know how this works. Um, in California, when there is a Senate vacancy, the governor makes an appointment. And we all just saw this happen, which is Kamala Harris became our vice president. And Governor Newsom appointed Alex Padilla. And Senator Padilla is serving. Um, he served out the rest of Senator Harris's term. And then he ran for re-election. And he won. And so now he's going to serve out a full six-year term. Mm -hmm. So if Senator Feinstein were to not complete her term through the end of 2024, then Governor Newsom would be able to appoint someone. Governor Newsom publicly promised on TV about you know, two years ago um, that if there was another vacancy, that he would appoint a black woman. And so, look, I think politicians should keep their promises. That's Gavin's promise, and I think he should probably keep it. Um, I think I, what I will say to you is I think that all of us who want to be senator should run. And I think actually Senator Feinstein herself said this. Anybody who wants to throw their hat in the ring and run to be California senator and can earn those votes and can do the work should do it. And so whether there's an appointment or not, Senator Feinstein, I very much hope she recovers and comes back and is, is at full force. But whatever happens, I'm going to stay in this race. And I'm, I'm running to win this race. Great. I'm a super fan. I knocked on doors um, in Orange County for you this past fall. Uh, but I'm one of those voters who wants to see more black men and women in the Senate. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on um, the, the racial injustice and, and lack of racial equity in the country, but specifically maybe uh, commenting on what's going on in Tennessee right now uh, on gun violence and as an issue that uh, affects communities of color, 
disproportionately and on the racism that is so blatant that we're all witnessing. Yep. Well, a lot in that question. <laughs> so, for so for so many of these issues, the answer is that we need to have the votes to get the the laws passed. So, with what's happening with gun violence prevention is we simply do not. People say to me, "Why doesn't Congress pass gun violence prevention?" And the answer is because we have too many people in Congress who will not vote for it. And I'm not trying to make it too simple, but that, that really is the problem. We have a lot of people who refuse to vote for gun violence prevention and they go back home and they campaign and they get reelected and we need to change that. So I think one of the things that I can, I can bring to the table is I know how to campaign. I said this before, I know how to campaign in a way that's gonna help us win some of those tough seats. And as we win more of those tough seats, we can deliver on the very priorities that communities of color particularly need. And so if we let the Republicans stay in the majority, if we allow California to become kind of the national uh, boogeyman for the Democratic Party, then we're not gonna have this, this majority, we're not gonna win the majorities that we need in the House and Senate um, to deliver. I, you know, sitting in the House, I was elected with so many amazing colleagues from 2018. I cannot wait to see some of these folks who are my dear friends, um, folks like Ayanna Presley and Lauren Underwood and Lisa Blunt Rochester and Joe Neguse. Uh, there are so many amazing um, folks who I think that we are going to diversify our Congress. We are going to have the kind of diverse representation that we need. Um, and I'm all in for helping those people get there. Okay. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Sara. I'm an, actually an Orange County resident. Um, I have two separate questions, not a two-part question, so. Um, <coughs> <coughs> one of them is a freebie, so don't worry. Um, the first question is, you said politics is like an insane mess, so I wonder how you do retain your sanity and how you are able to like sort of remove yourself from all the like just insanity and how you remove yourself from being entrenched in it. And then the second question is, how do I get involved in your campaign? Oh, um, so Very nice, the, the first question about how do you retain your sanity, I mean, I think part, writing the book was part of that process for me, mm -hmm. um, trying to find a, a little bit of space and kind of think through wh what happened and why do I feel this way and, and how do I put structure on it. But I would definitely say for me, it's, 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 coming, it's coming home. It's coming to California. Um, and so you, you sort of do your days in Washington and it, and it can, it can be difficult um, and you know you, you come home and you come back to California and you come back to the amazing things that we're doing here and the vision that we all have for our state um, and you come back to the piles of laundry and it's all very grounding um, and so I think that has been a big part of it um, and then I think in terms of getting involved in the campaign you can go to katieporter.com and sign up um, we're about eight, 10 months away from the primary election it's March 5th so voting will start February 5th um, and so we're going to be getting organized here over the summer to have more events and, and to do more. Um, I grew up in a state in Iowa where pretty much if you wanted to meet a candidate you just for president, you just went down to the pizza ranch. Um, <laughs> and so when I got here and I started my first campaign, I, my, my hope was that I would be able to shake, you know, like maybe 100,000 hands, 200,000 hands. Mm -hmm. And the attitude in California is often very different. It's we let the size and scale of the state in which you cannot possibly meet 39 million people, somehow work as an excuse sometimes to meet none. And I'm very committed to having that not be the case. So I'm very excited about being out and about in the community. I just took a tour of the um, Pinata Toy District here in Los Angeles. I was up in Davis, I mentioned. I did an event in um, Huntington Park looking at environmental justice issues. I'm heading to San Diego. Um, and so I'll be out and about campaigning. There'll be ways to get involved, but you can go sign up on the website um, at katieporter.com and stay up to date on things to get involved with. You, you alluded to um, California and you don't want it to be the national boogeyman. What do you mean by that? In what way is it, or is it portrayed as the national boogeyman? Yeah, so I think there has been, um, you know, sometimes we see this in, um, in political advertisements, you know, mm -hmm. what is happening in um, San Francisco is used, or mm -hmm. what's supposedly, purportedly happening in San Francisco gets used in ads in places like Chicago or in Minneapolis or, um, you know, California's a democratic state, so vote for Democrats and this or that will happen. Um, I think, you know, because we've elected the party leaders, both in, in Speaker Pelosi and now in Speaker McCarthy, um, those folks kind of loom large in the, in the political fight. And so I think, 
you know, one of the things that I think California should export because of the size of the state, because of the strength of our values and our vision and our diversity, is we should really be able to, to help people win um, and to be able to say, we've done it here and we want to help you do it where you are. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's important to have messengers who, who make it easier, not harder for folks to win. Yeah, I, I definitely think it's going through some identity crisis and it needs to actually win in some of these areas too. Um, there's so many problems there, especially in Southern California, um, especially with homelessness, as you were saying, affordable housing. Uh, but anyhow, go ahead. I was trying to say that real fast so we can get to the question. Hi, my name is Gardenia. Thank you so much for being here tonight. My question is, how do you prioritize the different needs of your constituents? And is it a lot like prioritizing the different needs of your children? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think with the constituents, some of it is about trying to balance um, what are their top priorities with where there are opportunities and try to line those up. Um, and so this year, for example, um, the b three bills that I think we're likely to, to pass in this Congress um, and to have signed into law are the Farm Bill, um, the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration um, Reauthorization Act, and the National Defense Appropriations Act. So on the Farm Bill, for example, Orange County has ser um, serious problems with hunger. Um, and with people um, having food insecurity. So the farm bill is a major vehicle to try to invest in that. California is the, we grow the fruits and vegetables for the nation, mm -hmm. but yet our farm bill really does not do right by um, our producers and by consumers who are trying to afford fresh fruits and vegetables. So there's a lot of opportunity. So sometimes it's, it's looking at what's there. Um, and I think most of all, I do it by listening to my constituents. You really, if you're searching for the answer for what the American people want, you are not gonna find it in the halls of the Capitol. You're gonna find it in your community. So a lot of the work I've done on mental health and, and better um, insurance coverage for mental health, the work I've done cracking out, down on big pharma, um, has work that I've done because folks in California have talked to me about what a problem this is in their life. Um, in terms of my kids, I mean, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of color-coded spreadsheets. Um, there's a lot of, <laughs> calendar reminders, there's a lot of stringing it together. Um, I think like most working parents, you just try to do the best you can, um, and sometimes you fall short. I recently was in Washington voting until Friday night and flew back and had to leave at 5 a.m. on Monday morning and didn't have time to go to the grocery store, but I had meal prepped, so I, I had meals made for my kids in advance, but um, I didn't go to the grocery store, and so there were no... Um, there was no cinnamon toast crunch, <laughs> and there were no Cheez-Its, and my children referred to this period as the Great Famine. <laughs> and so, you know, you win some, you lose some. I mean, I pointed out that it's Irvine, and it's like half a mile to the grocery store, and they could just walk on down there. Um, and they said, my one son said, they taste better when you buy them. <laughs> Very good. In the, in the back here? Uh, back in the back, yeah. Uh, hi, Representative Porter. Uh, thank you so much for being here. My name is Emmanuel. Um, I wanted to talk you, with you about an issue that is really relevant to young voters, which is uh, climate and environmental justice. Uh, I live and grew up in South Los Angeles, which uh, according to a study that was recently published by The Guardian, had the second worst air pollution in the whole country. And given your experience on the Natural Resources Committee, being a co-sponsor of the Green New Deal, I wanted to ask what aspects of the Green New Deal you think would be really valuable in addressing those issues, not just in my own community, but in, issue, in communities like that across the state? Yeah, um, thank you for your question. And as I mentioned, I, I recently was in um, Southeast LA and, and did a whole event around environmental justice, looking at some of the pollution um, and some of the contamination. And so I think it's really important as we think about transitioning and moving toward clean energy, that we think about making sure that we are rectifying um, as part of that transition, some of the costs of our fossil fuel dependence. And so I think this means putting a lot of res resources into having our ports be cleaner. Um, the communities surrounding the ports suffer some of the worst air yeah. um, pollution and water pollution in the country. I think it means when we think about protecting land and setting land aside, President Biden made a promise 30% of, fe of federal land set aside for conservation by 2030. Um, the fast way to do that is just to protect like a big chunk of Montana, 
but that isn't going to deliver the shade canopy and the recreation space and um, deal with some of the issues of, of heat, um, extreme heat zones um, that we need to do. So I think there's a, the part of the Green New Deal that I think is sort of the most misunderstood, but, the, but really, really important, is that it is a transformation not just from fossil fuel to clean energy, but also a transformation from a workforce that is exposed to toxins and that is made sick from communities that are polluted into, into jobs where people are safe and free of pollution and communities that all have the opportunity to have clean air and clean water and good public health. And, and that's, that's why we don't talk about it as just an energy bill. We talk about it as an entire new deal in that it would really mm -hmm. um, really realign and address some of the historical inequities that we face. It's really a great question because do you think that the attention on environmental existentialism kind of takes away from environmental uh, justice, you know, and some of the issues this gentleman was talking about? Because what you're saying, how people, you know, should be able to live <laughs> in their own communities is very important, arguably more important than the earth may go away <laughs> you know, well, the, you know the, some the, of these arguments. Not that they're not important. Yeah. This is but the great I think, thing. I, I think that's where the, the bait and switch comes, where people can't see that these are the actual issues. So I think yeah. the great thing is the path to cleaner energy is also a path to addressing environmental injustices if we do it right. And that means we need folks who live in communities that have been hurt by pollution, mm -hmm. and we need people of color and people who are who have been exposed to these kinds of um, clean air and, and dirty, dirty air and dirty water to be part of the clean energy movement, be part of the climate movement. And we need to center and listen to those voices. And I think the chairman of the Natural Resources Committee, Rahul Grijalva, is really terrific at doing this. Um, but you know, this means that when we're siting solar panels, or we're thinking about where to put wind turbines, where are we going to put the manufacturing that's going to manufacture these new wind and solar things? What about um, you know, mining for rare minerals and, and minerals that we need mm -hmm. for batteries? We need to not make the same mistakes with regard to mining for those minerals that we need for clean energy that we made with regard to oil production. It can't be the same communities right. and the same people, particularly people of color, who always pay the price for something that we all benefit from, yeah, which is people. ample energy. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, two more okay. questions. Two more? OK. What do we got? Oh, here we go. Hello, my name's Lauren. Um, I actually came here for Larry, but I'm so happy that I came because I've learned so much. So. Um, so I am a mother and I'm also a transplant here to California and I've actually lived in four other states and California is by far the most difficult that I've lived in while raising kids. Um, knowing that you're a single mother and also kind of considering and kind of knowing and thinking about the max, mass exodus that we've seen in California post the pandemic, um, what are some of the ways um, that you have worked and ensuring that there's an easier way for us to bridge the gap between working families, those families that fight for resources um, in comparison to affluent families and families that seem to have resources at their fingertips. Yeah, so I think this um, goes back a little bit to how I was um, talking about childcare earlier, which is I think that often Republicans will present um, choices to invest in what families need, and they don't use the word invest, right? They use the word of, of you know, of, of giveaways, right, to, to families in need as something that takes away from those who are not in need. And I think that is incredibly mistaken and mm -hmm. wrongheaded and dangerous. We all benefit from a strong, stable, globally competitive economy. All of us, okay, now maybe if you're like a bankruptcy lawyer, you don't benefit, but everybody else benefits from a strong, stable, globally competitive economy. And to do that, to have that workforce that's gonna deliver that economy, we need to be investing in early childhood education for every single child, right? To have that, um, to, to have the ability to compete for the kinds of high-tech jobs that we need. We need to invest in making sure every child with the talent and the capacity to go to college has a spot in the system and is able to afford to get there. And so I think that one of the things that Democrats really need to lean into is talking about these programs as what they are, which is universally beneficial. 
right? It's not about what do I get and what do you get and what are you going to do for this person and that person. It's the lifting up and making sure that every American has the opportunity to thrive makes the lives of those who are already thriving better and more rewarding. And that is the mindset shift that I think Democrats need to really lean into helping people see. So I have people who say to me, I don't want to, you know, I paid for my college, so I don't want to do anything about the costs of, of college going forward. Well, you paid $50 a semester. And that was great and good for you. But I want the people who are going to take care of me as I age to be educated, to be trained, to be skilled. I want there to be that workforce here in our state and here in our country. So I, I think the Republicans, and this is I think a legacy really going back to Reagan, but has continued on, is mm -hmm. to really present everything as a scarcity. There's not enough of anything. And so we have to choose who gets it. That is complete nonsense. Education is not like diamonds. If we need more universities and spots in our UC system, then by God, we should have them. Right? And it's a false choice to treat that as something that we can't afford. We can't afford, in fact, not to educate every person to their capacity. Um, and so, you know, we can't afford not to have children who are flourishing and thriving. So when we, when we think about food assistance for somebody who's experiencing um, hunger, that, that person being fed and nourished, that is an investment in our future economy. That's an investment in a future worker, in a coworker, in a neighbor, in a colleague, in someone I might worship with. So I think that politics, we need to have a politics of abundance. We are the wealthiest nation in the world and we need to, to live our collective, collective lives like it. I think, uh, yeah, I agree. It's funny, it's ironic that um, for years and years, college was pretty much free in California, and Reagan changed that kind of out of spite to get back at the students who were protesting against it. Yep. A little bit of history, you guys. A little bit of history. It was free. And our final um, question. Do we have one here? more? Or we have Darlene in the back? Yeah. Hi, my name is Dorothy, and you are my person. I live in Orange County, and I live in Huntington Beach. And this is not a question, this is a statement to you. You have the skill set to make changes and to be a force in the federal government. I'm not gonna say the W word, which is stay woke, but I want you not to get weary. Remember, I am counting on you to do like John Lewis said and get in good trouble. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I just, if I just can pick up on that, I. I, I think what she said to me is something that I, that I want to reflect back mm -hmm. on to all of you and something that I talk a little bit about, about in the book. Nobody gets elected alone. Mm -hmm. I don't care how much they pretend. They are not fooling me. People get elected because of people who help, people who knock doors, people who chip in $3, people who remember to vote on a day when they just want to go home. Um, and so we all need to kind of support each other and not getting weary. Democracy is a hell of a lot of work, but by it's, it's good work. It is righteous work. Um, and so I think we all need to support ourselves in this. And I think we need to find time and moments to celebrate our successes. And I think one of the things the Republicans with their antics, um, to put it gently, are kind of doing is, is stripping away our ability to celebrate the amazing things that we have accomplished and that we, and that we do accomplish. And I, I think that that is really rooted in what we have all been doing in these last few years. So I don't want any of you to get weary either um, because we are in this together. And I think the future of California and of this country is incredibly bright. And I'm excited to be part of it um, with you at my back. So thank you so much. Yeah.